What's up guys? I'm Dave Klein and welcome back to my Dark Souls lore series. Today we're going to talk about Seath the Scaleless. As the betrayer of the dragons and the godfather of sorcery, he's actually quite the influential character. So, let's get started. And Seath the Scaleless betrayed his own, and the dragons were no more. In the beginning, before the lords fought the dragons, there is one dragon in particular who was an outcast, Seath. Seath was born without the stone scales of the everlasting dragons, and as a result, it would seem lack the immortality of the dragons. Either out of jealousy or simply the lust for immortality, when Gwyn presented Seath the opportunity to betray his kin, he did so, and it would seem in order to gain the primordial crystal. The secret? of Seath's immortality. It is an effect of the primordial crystal, a sacred treasure pillaged by Seath when he turned upon the ancient dragons. We know, due to Seath's bequeathed Lord Soul, that Seath allied with Lord Gwyn and turned upon the dragons, and for this he was awarded dukedom, embraced by the royalty and given a fragment of a great soul. In being awarded dukedom, Seath created a royal archive of knowledge, where he would retreat in order to study the soul and immortality. His studies and attempts at understanding this led to several major influences throughout Lordran and the surrounding lands. We learn from the Homing Crystal Soul Mass that the mysteries of souls, crystals, and the sorceries are deeply intertwined. If souls, crystals, and the sorceries are deeply intertwined, it's interesting then that it is a primordial crystal that grants Seath his immortality. So if Seath was studying the primordial crystal, this is what would eventually allow him to discover and grandfather in sorcery. For cutting off Seath's tail, players will receive the Moonlight Sword, which tells us Seath is the grandfather of sorcery, and this sword is imbued with his magic, which shall be unleashed as a wave of moonlight. As crystals and sorcery are intertwined, Seath is known for both. The Crystal Ember, found in the Duke's archives, is known as a Crystal Ember created by Seath the Scaleless. Additionally, the most advanced sorceries are crystal sorceries, discovered by Big Hat Logan only after arriving at the Duke's archives. Also linking advanced sorceries to Seath is the Large Magic Ember. The Large Magic Ember, a form of sorcery handled only by the Vinheim blacksmiths, can be found in Seath's study only after defeating Seath. The sorcery's Soul Arrow tells us Soul Arrows inflict magic damage, making them effective against iron armor, tough scales, and other physically resilient materials. The interesting bit of information here is that Soul Arrow is effective against tough scales, and it would seem possible the stronger variations of Soul Arrow were developed by Seath in order to fight against the dragons. And yet, Soul Arrow and many sorceries are taught in the Vinheim Dragon School, a school that is known for teaching sorcery. On top of that, Seath's large magic ember can be handled only by the Vinheim blacksmiths. I believe it is very likely Seath is the influence for this school and whom the school is named after. When looking at the outlying lands, it seems that many have been influenced by the reign of Gwyn, and the only dragon who would have a positive light on them would be Gwyn's duke, Seath the Scaleless. Furthermore, Seath, as the godfather of sorcery, would be revered by those who study the art, and we see this quite clearly in Big Hat Logan, who has made it his mission in undeath to seek out Seath and the Regal Archives. And besides, what other dragons do we know of who use sorcery? None. While Seath did usher in an understanding of sorcery and its relation to souls and crystal, some of his methods were frowned upon. A great pool of knowledge, the fruits of superior wisdom, and an unquenchable desire for the truth. Some would say Seath had an unsound fixation, but his work is a beautiful, invaluable resource. All progress demands sacrifice, and I certainly bear no antipathy for that wonderful, scaleless beast. All progress demands sacrifice. In order to test out his theories, Seath began to gather various maidens and humans throughout the land and began to experiment on them. He sent out channelers in order to obtain and capture those maidens, the channelers being described as sorcerers that serve Seath the Scaleless, 
Even after the onset of Seath's madness, the Snatchers, as they were often called, ventured to far lands to find suitable human specimens. We can witness this ourselves, as when Rhea of Thurland begins praying in the undead church right in the eyesights of a channeler, she will eventually be snatched and taken to the Duke's archives. The archive tower giant cell key tells us the giant cell once imprisoned countless maidens, but is now empty save for a few key persons. They struggle to uphold their sanity as the horde of mistakes writhe at a fearfully close proximity. These mistakes being the Picassas. The maiden set can be found in the archive tower, and it would seem some of these weren't just any maidens. When fighting the Picassas, two will remain crying in the back and will never aggro against you, even after being attacked. Upon killing them, they drop the miracle of soothing sunlight and bountiful sunlight. These are the miracles of Guinevere, the princess cherished by all. It is clear that these two, in particular, were handmaidens of Guinevere. Now, as a side note, the archive tower where the maidens and prisoners were kept also contains a bonfire that traps undead inside of a cell. Within the archive tower giant cell, players can find a firekeeper's soul. I believe in his knowledge of how undeath works, Seath captured a firekeeper in order to create a bonfire in his prison, allowing him to capture the undead and thus the reasoning for both. In experimenting on the maidens, Seath created the Picassas as a mistake who interestingly have tales that look very similar to Seath's. When venturing into the Crystal Forest, players can find more of Seath's creations. The Crystal Golems and a walking manifestation of the crystals Seath has discovered help the channelers capture maidens. We find one in the Crystal Forest itself, with Seagland captured inside one of its giant crystals. In the Darker Basin, another Crystal Golem can be found having captured Dusk of Ulysseel. Yet another creation can be found in the Moonlight Butterflies. The soul of the Moonlight Butterfly is described as the soul of the mystical Moonlight Butterfly, which flitters in the Dark Root Garden. Special beings have special souls. The Butterfly's soul is a creation of Seath the Scaleless. But why is the Moonlight Butterfly in Dark Root Basin, as well as the Crystal Golems? While both the Crystal Ember and Large Magic Ember are found in the Duke's archives, the Enchanted Ember is found in Dark Root Garden. The Enchanted Ember being a form of sorcery and a vestige of the lost land of Ulysseel. I believe it all has to do with Ulysseel. The vast majority of the sorceries in the game not found from Vinheim or Seath are found from Ulysseel. Spells such as Cast Light are described as ancient sorceries of the lost land of Ulysseel. The light producing sorcery is elementary, but nonetheless demonstrates the achievements and mysticism of Ulysseel. Such magic has not been developed even in Vinheim. My home, Ulysseel, is the home of ancient sorceries. The sorceries of Ulysseel differ from the magic of thine age. It is difficult to explain. Ulysseel's sorceries are, what doth one say? <laughs> They're somewhat of an approximation. Thine sorceries are more straightforward, negating all but thyself. Dost thou not find some fascination in these discrepancies? I believe that Seath finds a fascination with these discrepancies, and he has sent his creations to the former land of Ulysseel to gather what knowledge they can to bring back to him so he can study the sorceries created by Ulysseel. If players have downloaded the DLC, yet a further connection exists in the Broken Pendant, which can be found by killing the Crystal Golem in the Duke's archives. The Broken Pendant's vine appears to originate from Ulysseel, and is used by players to return back to Ulysseel in the DLC. But in the end, Seath went mad. According to the Archive Tower's cell key, the Archive Tower, once a trove of precious tomes and letters, became a prison after the onset of Seath's madness. While it's never explicitly explained why Seath went mad, I believe it's a commentary on knowing too much and going too far. The idea that there are some things beyond human comprehension and we were never meant to understand. Some things to think about. Seath also had his enemies. Havel the Rock made it his mission in life to destroy Seath. According to the miracle Great Magic Barrier, Havel the Rock, an old battlefield compatriot of Lord Gwyn, was the sworn enemy of Seath the Scaleless. He despised magic and made certain to devise means of counteraction. It's never clear why Havel despised magic, but do you believe there was any reason in particular? 
Could it have had anything to do with Cease's methods of experimenting on maidens? It would seem Havel visited Ash Lake, as his great magic barrier can be found there, and he wields the Dragon Tooth. So maybe his hatred of Seath began after his trip to Ash Lake and discovering the ancient dragon. Another oddity with Seath is in his relation to Ash Lake. The Persian stone bearing clams from Ash Lake can also be found right in front of Seath's lair. Additionally, the only two locations of hydras in the game are in Ash Lake and the Darkroot Basin, where the hydra is surrounded by crystal golems and near Seath's moonlight butterfly. Perhaps Seath brought these creatures with him in order to study or utilize. As it would seem Havel visited Ash Lake, perhaps Seath actually brought the clams and hydra down there in order to prevent more undead from discovering the ancient dragon. Or perhaps there is no real correlation. What do you guys think? One final bonus note about Seath for those of you who don't know. Seath is actually a reoccurring character in From Software's games. The Ancient Dragon had a major role in From Software's first foray into video games, the King's Field series, as the White Dragon God who warred against Gyra, the Black Dragon God. Seath's weakness was Gyra's weapon, the Moonlight Sword, and the Moonlight Sword is used in Japan's King's Field 3 in order to slay the final boss of the PlayStation franchise, Seath. Alright guys, that's going to wrap up this Dark Souls lore video. As always, let me know what you guys think in the comments, and what you think the Ash Lake correlation to Seath is. I'd like to give props to MS Painting, John Quick, and Terramantis on helping me with some details. And I know both Terramantis and Silvermont are working on Seath videos as well, so definitely support them both, and check out their versions of Seath's lore when they're complete. Alright, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.